Mike Norvell may have inherited a dumpster fire, but that is no excuse for his performance on the field relative to other second year head coaches. He's laid some foundation. He's laid some bricks. He has us in the right direction, but it has not been enough so far. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the quarterback recruiting situation, and we're going to talk about the softball coach situation and more on today's edition of Locked on Seminoles. Max, Dave, let's roll the video. Let's get started. You are Locked on Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Locked on Seminoles. Today is mandatory Mailbag Monday. There might be a special prize if you can tell us in the YouTube comments what Florida State tradition that title is a reference to. I'm your host, Max, and right there, we've got David Weiss, Esquire. Like we said, today is the mailbag. So, Davey, let's get right to it. We got tons of comments. If you're on YouTube, make sure that you subscribe. Make sure that you click the bell so you get notifications when our new episodes drop, which is typically Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform. This week, we're starting on Tuesday because obviously Memorial Day, which is the day we're recording this, we didn't drop an episode because we all had stuff going on. Now, Dave, this first question is from Dustin Gadge or just Dustin Guy, Dustin G. His last name is G-A-J. And it's related to us doing doing our comparison last week of Norvell to other second going on third year coaches and how far behind he is relative to these coaches that have all had success. So what he says is FSU players were on their third or fourth coordinator since being at the school, their third head coach, and were dealing with a development program, including a strength and conditioning program that was in a very bad state. Additionally, it's pretty naive to just look at recruiting class rankings as a level of talent on the roster because many of those players that were supposedly highly rated had already left or ended up leaving and went on to another school where they were also not any good. If you don't believe there's a deep state of cultural decay at FSU, you're not very informed. Uh, That gets on to another question from James B. Same topic. Ole Miss and Arkansas, who are two of the coaches we looked at, make about $25 million a year more than FSU. So comparing any SEC team to any ACC team at this time is apples to oranges. FSU is not a dumpster fire? Question mark. Two laughing faces. Well, I hate to see what your version of a dumpster fire is. Of course, you're not taking COVID into effect one bit. Besides comparing one football program to another is like comparing peanut shells. They all look the same, but no one is exactly the same as the other. Norvell was the best option he had. He was the best option we could afford, and he's done an exemplary job of turning the culture around. He laid the foundation and now starting to lay the bricks for a football program worthy of Florida State. All you impatient fans will not recognize what it truly takes to rebuild a football program. Or you're just young and unfortunately have never witnessed a dominant Florida State program. I'm a 40-year-old fan, a 40-year fan. Oh, well, that's impressive. Uh, So I guess for me, that'll be when I'm 42. This November, I'm a booster and a member of Rising Spear. I have full faith in Mike Norvell and believe we'll see it pay off this year. Sorry, that was a lot of words, but there's a reason I took both those questions. It's because James said he was a member of Rising Spear and a booster. And I think he has some moments in there. First of all, you should all be boosters. Thanks, James. Um, I think he had some things in there we can really touch on. Dustin, I think, is more of the making the same talking point that Norvell can do no wrong. I mean... Dave, what's the word? Florida State fans, here's the thing, guys. I've been a Florida State fan for 30 years at this point. I guess 28 years at this point. And I've seen us through the highs and lows. My season tickets were Section 33, Row 1, during the lost decade. I sat on the front row in the most booster-heavy section and watched us get shut out by Wake Forest. Same here. So I've been there. I've also been in the room with the big boosters. I've heard the conversations that happened on the side. I know how these things work. I'm a member of the boosters now. Dave, you are as well. I know it was a dumpster fire. 
And when you say that things were, you know, looking only at recruiting class rankings as a level of talent, blah, 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 they've gone on to be bad. Yeah, except for the safety that you lost to Boston College, who's the best player on that team. <laughs> and or the, the defensive de lineman that you lost to in NC North Carolina State. State. Yeah, who's the yeah. best player on that defense right now in Corey Durden. Yeah. You know, look, I, th this is a whole conversation about what it means to be a dumpster fire, I think. Um, I, I think the idea that we can't compare ourselves to SEC programs just because they make more money, man, if, if that's the truth, that we it's cannot compare ourselves to teams that make more money, we're done. Because I have news for you. We're not going to be making the same money as most other teams in P5 conferences for a long time until we change conferences or somehow the ACC gets some inexplicably massive TV deal. That financial disparity is going to be there. And nevertheless, we still recruited better than those schools that we talked about. Um, should recruiting guide the entire conversation? No, but it's indicative of the fact that that was the baseline talent level. Like over the time, blue chip mat like like stars matter in recruiting. That's been proven. I mean, not on a case by case basis, but on a large in the scale aggregate. over time, it matters. And you had better recruiting classes over several cycles at Florida State than most of those other schools we compared ourselves to uh, prior to or when Norvell came in and. Those other coaches did more with a hell of a lot more with a lot less talent. And I just wonder if you had brought one of those other coaches in here, are we really looking at the exact same record? I think, you know, that was kind of the point of the exercise for me is if you bring in Dave Aranda, uh, do we have the same record the last two years? I don't think the answer is yes. And that says something. I don't think Mike Norvell, you know, needs to be fired tomorrow or anything. I'm still giving him a chance. I still think he can do the job, but as of right now, he's wildly underperformed. Agreed. And, and I think that's why I liked James's comment, right? When he says they've done an exemplary, he's done an exemplary job of turning the culture around. I couldn't agree more. True. I mean, we, we, look, we talked about this last year where it was like, you feel bad giving, not bad, you feel dumb at Florida State giving them credit for trying, but at least they were trying because <laughs> in 2019, they weren't trying at all. Like our yeah. teams just quit every game. If they got down by seven, the game was over, you know, whatever. So James, I think you're absolutely right in that, Yes, he has done a great job of turning that around. When you say that, you know, it, he's done the things that we need to do to rebuild the the football program and has been laying the foundation and laying the bricks, I totally agree with you on that as well. I think what Mike Norvell has done here, and obviously, again, this is a booster talking in these questions, who has seen it from the inside, just as you and I have, he has undone a lot of the bad things that Jimbo did towards the end. Yep. And Willie just ignored, and that's great. However, it doesn't change the fact that he has wildly underperformed because there's no law that says you can't do both. You can get your team to start trying harder, but also win more games. Yep. And also, the last thing I'd like to say, just as a point of personal privilege, I didn't say it wasn't a dumpster fire, but I did say that Baylor had a dumpster fire. Again, they were less years removed from the biggest sex scandal to hit college football since Penn State. Less years removed from that than we were from making the playoffs and winning a national championship in consecutive years. So that was also a dumpster fire. And it's freaking Baylor. You want to say how much money Ole Miss and Arkansas make? I agree with you, but that's not going to change. So either you're saying that we just should let the SEC be pro football and we're just going to give up and we'll never win playoffs which I don't think any Florida State fan wants to hear or agrees with, or you need to be able to compare Florida State to SEC schools, but we also compare them to a Big Ten school. We also compare them to a Big 12 school. We also looked over at the Pac-12. Those are all conferences where, yes, they're making some more money, but not to the degree where you should just throw your hands up and say, well, that's not a fair comparison. Yeah, and look, Compared to what Florida State's been historically, the 80s, the 90s, and, and even within the last decade, we are a dumpster fire compared to that. However, I don't think you can call something a dumpster fire when if you take any of 25 to 30 other coaches in the country who are doing their jobs well, plug and place them with the exact same roster and situation, and they have a better record, I, I, suddenly that doesn't seem like as much of a dumpster fire to me so much as just bad set of circumstances and people in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
Yeah, agreed. And and I think that was the point. So James, thanks for the question, man. And I, and I think, again, you're right. He has done a good job of turning the culture around. He has laid a solid foundation. Yep. The question is, will it be him or the next guy that gets us to the next step? But I will say this, if Mike Norvell's contract is not renewed and in 20, whatever that'd be 24, we have a new head coach coming in and that head coach wins 10 games, then wins 11 and then wins, you know, gets us to a playoff. You will hear us on this program to some degree giving Mike Norvell credit. Absolutely. Because there's he what he has done as a CEO organizationally has been incredible. So I will give him that credit, but I will also say, based on what we've seen from other head coaches that are in his same tenure that came into bad programs that had less talent on the roster, he has not performed up to expectations. And then last thing I'll say, because we mentioned this, but whatever. I don't even remember which question said it. Um, we, we did mention COVID, but in only if you got COVID, this remember. is crazy. This is crazy, but we do our research and we talk to people and it doesn't, I have asked high school head coaches about the recruiting effects of COVID. I've asked college coaches about it. I've asked analysts about it. I've asked boost people that work in the boosters about it. I've asked people that work in the athletic department, not just at our school, but at other schools about it. And all of them tell me the same thing unanimously i have not had one person tell me this when it is behind a closed door and they're not trying to sell me something they have all said well hey man everyone dealt with that <laughs> right every single program dealt with covid including new head coaches who we just went down the list have all outperformed mike norvell so yes covid happened yes we dealt with it but again it's not an excuse Dave, I want to get to our next question, but before we do that, I want to tell the folks about a place where they can have a little fun and maybe make a little money, and that's at betonline.net. Hmm. Hey, I'm not a wagerer anymore, but if you are, you should go to betonline.net. That's a good place to go because they've got the most lines, the most odds, the most props, and the most places to put your action. You like horse racing? Great. You like the NHL? Fantastic. You like the MLB? Even better. It's all going on right now, and it is all able to be bet upon at betonline.net. Betonline.net, where the game starts. Folks, if you're still here, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube. Florida State fan, not Florida State fan, it's all good. Fred Petrie, if you're listening to this, we love that you're hanging around, man. Saw your comment. And yeah, we we did give the LSU D-line the respect they deserve. Um Dude, that's a tough D line we're gonna face, and I I will not shy away from that. Um, th it, look, that's a very good D line. The interesting thing is going to be well, it's two things. One, I don't really know what kind of scheme they're gonna run because they've got a new D coordinator, and I don't know. It, it's hard to go watch a coordinator's last stop and know how quickly are they going to try to fully implement what they want with I that mean, personnel and right. We're what three year, going on year three, and we still say like, and, and it's true. Norvell hasn't really gotten to the offense he wants to run yet. Yep. So you don't know, but this D line, our O line, A, has some good talent on it now, uh, has a little more depth thanks to the, another transfer and Dimitri Emanuel added. And Atkins is really good at motion based blocking schemes where if they try to play gap technique, you can really take advantage of that. Now, my, my intuition tells me when you've got guys that are as talented as LSU's D line, it makes sense to put them against the not great O-line or perceived not great. It makes sense to put them in a gap technique. Now, what that is, is there are two ways that D linemen can play. They can play in a man technique where they line up across from someone and their job is that, that person, or they play in a gap technique. So they're responsible for the A gap or the B gap or the C gap. Typically you will play gap technique. And if I'm off here, by the way, any coaches listening, please correct me, but this is my understanding from, my playing days and you know keeping up with with um the with coaching and things like that so i give you all the best information but typically you will let your your big boys play that gap technique when you know or you're confident they can take on more than one guy at a time because you want them to have to dedicate two blockers to that guy in a double team or him be able to clog the gap and not let that lineman release to the second level and i think if they're doing that atkins is going to find a way to creatively use pulling and use during the play line motion to i don't want to say render them ineffective the entire game but that will be the goal and i think if you get a couple plays where you get some good motion cooked up and you can kind of move the d line in one direction 
and you have the running backs that we've seen in this backfield with the explosive ability or Jordan Travis with the explosive ability with his legs, you could see some pretty big runs. All that aside, the other part of his question, he mentioned the five stars that LSU is going after and Ricky Collins is their fallback plan. We also have a, a question coming in or a statement from Khalil Young, who comments a lot. Khalil, we love reading them. Um, hoping we hang on to Parsons. We've got a couple other questions about, you know, what does the do the offers extended to Ricky Collins and Brock Glenn, both 2023 quarterbacks, mean for the hanging on for for um for uh Chris Parsons, who is currently committed to Florida State as a quarterback. Now, Dave, I'm sure you've seen on Twitter going around that um uh, Parsons decided to announce that he has received an offer from Mississippi State. He plans to take a visit there. Have you been following this much at all? I mean, how do you feel in this moment as a Florida State fan with a longtime committed QB saying he's going to visit another school? It <laughs> Are you getting flashbacks? Yeah, man. It feels real familiar, doesn't it? Um, it creates a weird situation for us because – we know historically that you could go into signing day with your quarterback that morning or your player, elite player that morning telling you we're good here signing. Can't wait to get on campus. Um, and then later that day, he's not, and he's going somewhere else. So, it, you know, because of that, you have to go out and because of the lack of depth at quarterback for at least based on what we know now at Florida state, you have to go out and sign as many talented quarterbacks as you can. So to, if, if, I'm not saying this is happening. If Chris Parsons said, I don't want you recruiting another quarterback or I'm gone. I don't know that you could just say, okay, fine. Like, right. I don't know that we have the depth, although he would be one of the most talented quarterbacks on the roster, but I think you need more than one. So it just creates a weird situation where you either knowingly hamstring your depth and numbers at quarterback, especially because it's a friggin' turnstile the way tra the transfer portal works with quarterbacks now. Or, or you try to recruit more than one, possibly lose him, and then all of a sudden you're getting one guy who's not as good as him and then another guy, and the aggregate of the two don't add up to what Parson would have been. It will never know what could have or would have or should have been. Uh, but uh, is there an answer in your mind as to, like, say Parson is the best of the quarterbacks you're recruiting? Do you just lock it down at that point? No, I don't think you can. And, that, and that's the tough part is, in my mind, in my heart, I want to say, yeah, if he wants you to only recruit one, do that. But we have seen time and time again, and I'm not bashing these kids, by the way. I think these kids should be keeping their options open, especially with NIL. I mean, dude, you're. I remember in high school when I got my first summer job, it would have been going into my junior year, and we got paid once a month. And I got my first paycheck, and it was $1,200 because I was working full time over the summer. And it, Dude, I thought I was the queen of Sheba. Like, I thought $1,200. I'm surprised. Like, if I told me back then, what, 12 years later, 13, no, 14 years later at this point, that I'm not still living off that $1,200, I think you'd be a little surprised, you know? Yeah, right. So when you have these kids where there's an opportunity that, that they could get offered 10, 20, 30, 40 plus thousand dollars a year at that age, Dude, keep your options open. You will get no hate from me. But you got to understand the other side of that coin is that the school needs to be able to keep their options open. Let me ask you a question. Let me change it a little. I can guarantee you right now that in two years, Chris Parson will be DeAndre Francois on the field. Does that change your opinion as to whether you're recruiting anyone else? But you're not guaranteeing he'll be at Florida State? I'm guaranteeing you that in two years, he'll be starting at Florida State, the quality of DeAndre Francois. But... I'm not guaranteeing you the depth behind him or anything. So you're not recruiting anyone oh, else. Then, yeah, class. I drop everyone immediately. Yeah, okay. yeah, of course. But my issue is like, I, what if he's DeAndre Francois in two years and that's guaranteed, but him signing with you isn't guaranteed? Yeah. Do you risk only recruiting one quarterback then to have a Sam Howell situation? Or do, I'm asking, like that, I'm flipping the question. What, what's your answer to that? Guaranteed Francois performance, not guaranteed signing in December. Do you rescind the other two offers and, and only stick with Parsons? I don't, I, I don't think he can, uh, even guaranteeing that he's going to be a Frenchie. We, we've seen it twice now losing like blue chip quarterbacks. It can't happen again. It, it, that would devastate us for the next several years. Yeah. See, that's my position too, is, is you just, because what, if, what if Jordan Travis 
throws for 3,800 yards this year. And you people are looking going, holy cow, who is this Tony Tokar's guy? <laughs> and, and let me do you one better. He throws for 3,800 and he has two games over 400. And the first thing he says in both those press conferences, well, Coach Tokar saw this in the defense and got me ready. Well, Jordan, you're, how'd, how'd you go to 68% completion? Well, Coach Tokar's over the summer had me do this. And now people are beating down the door for Tokar's. Will that mm -hmm. happen? Probably not, but let's say it does. And let's say Kenny Dillingham, who worked with him, right, who was his boss as an OC to an analyst, calls up Tony and says, hey, man, I've got a million bucks a year for you to come out here. And it wouldn't be that. I've got 300K a year for you to come out to Eugene and be our quarterback's coach so I can focus on OC duties. Boom, Tokars is gone. Maybe Parsons says, I don't even know who the other guy's going to be, and he's at Mississippi State. And Can't now happen. you got no one, right? So like, I, we didn't even have to get that much into the hypothetical, but I think we're on the same page here. Yep. Um, that being said, gut reaction. Do you think Chris Parsons is in this class? Yes. And I think no one else is. Hmm. I'm the opposite. I think, no, I, I think that you lose him. And I think that you get one of these guys between Glenn or Collins. And I think you end up getting one more that they end up offering in the fall. Uh, let me change that. If Parson is in this class, I think you have some like last minute three star from like Fresno or some something just random. So I think that's going to happen regardless. Okay, so we're on the same page because I, I think you're going to end up with a kid that doesn't cur you'll end up with a rod maker, a kid that like doesn't have an offer yet. That like will a get five one. foot eight lefty, and it's like hmm, okay, well, Rod's an athlete, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, exactly. But yes, you will you will get someone like that. Yeah. So, folks, if you are still rod, oh wait, let me pause. It's local ads. So, folks, if you are still rocking and rolling with us, we appreciate it that you are here at your favorite Florida State talk show with your favorite Florida State talk people. Make sure you subscribe, make sure you like the video, and make sure to comment down below if you want to be featured on next week's Mailbag Monday. Dave, I think we're going to have to get into the mailbag a little more later in the week because th there are a few more questions. But um, to wrap it up, we wanted to talk about the Lonnie Alameda situation. Yep. Uh, Lonnie Alameda, for those of y'all that don't know, although I don't know if whatever, she is the head softball coach here. She has won what one national title played for two or three. Yep. We were in the finals last year, if you don't remember. Um, and then we, we actually beat Oklahoma in game one and then lost two in a row to them. Same girl pitched every single pitch for them <laughs> right. the entire time. That was nuts. Well, in a familiar situation, Texas A&M has decided to come knock on the door and offer her I, I believe the official term is a buttload of money yeah something is like that, that. The, is that is that what a bank is that what a, the irs would classify it as i believe um, so yeah the, the kind where you get you get your own special group of auditors and uh to steal our softball coach away now dave that makes me touch on two things one i go back to the earlier question by uh james b right where he said they make that Ole Miss and Arkansas makes a lot more than we do or make a lot more than we do. It's yep. true. But realize all that money doesn't have to go to football. It's going to athletic departments. So let me ask you, let me ask you this. This is rhetorical, but I also want to hear your voice, Dave, because I love it so much. Thanks, man. Is it a coincidence that the new deal with ESPN gets inked and all of a sudden this year, half of the SEC is ranked in basketball? No, a hundred percent not. <laughs> the SEC is notoriously bad at basketball. So, like, I mean, except for Kentucky and every now and then Florida, and just mm -hmm. weirdly recently Alabama. Sometimes now nobody cares about SEC basketball, including SEC basketball. So, no, that's not a good. Yep. Except this year, it was Auburn was number two at one point. Yeah. Alabama was. Now it was funny to see during tournament time. They got what I like to call the Pac-12 football treatment in the tournament, right? Where the ACC resoundingly said, "Okay." Have a seat, kids. We know you had a fun regular season and you looked really good doing it, but let's show you what putting two teams in the final four really looks like. And then Kansas shut all that down. So what do you make of this? Oh, sorry. I guess let me finish that thought. The point is that money is going to matriculate to the rest of athletics. It's it's not, they can't at a certain point where we are now, the universities can't pay the players. It has to be through these collectives. So they have to spend the money on something like you can only have so many football only facilities. And I guess Texas A&M has decided that they want to be really good at softball. I, I, what do you make of this, man? Here, Well, what I make of it, first of all, is fuck you, Texas A&M. Just 
cut it out. Stop taking all our good coaches. Um, although Fair. the Jimbo thing, it's kind of funny that he like owns half of Texas A&M now because of that contract. But that aside, it would be a really, really bad look for Florida State to lose Coach Alameda in our arguably our most consistent and best program since football has sucked and even arguably before then. Um, look, we just lost uh, Kokorian from the soccer team. The circumstances were a little different, though that did piss a lot of people off, just like the optics of it were weird. Like, wait, we just won national championships and stuff. And wait, now our coach is gone. Did we not pay him enough? You know, there's details of that. But like the amount of money he wanted was intentionally so ridiculous that we would never be able to match it. However, this situation almost feels like one where because of that, and because this is the remainder of the flagship program whose coaching is still intact, you have to do whatever the hell it takes, right? I mean, there's a number where, like, no matter what you're going to say, you know, we're not doing that. Come on. Um, especially with our renewed commitment to football more than ever or more than in a long time. Uh, but what I make of it is this is a this is a must do situation for this athletic department. I think you have to figure out a way to keep her here. Uh, we have this like. First of all, we're good. The softball team deserves all the support, but there's like a new cult following, it feels like, of this softball team because of how damn good they are and because it makes people happy on like a lot of Florida State sports. And you got to keep those people happy because I think those people are also football fans and boosters. And it's just, you know, got to keep the harmony here. Gosh, she is 555 and 167 at Florida State. <laughs> she has a 77% win percentage and she is 201 and 47 in the ACC with a, that's an 81% win percentage. Um her past seasons finishes are as follows. Runner up in the Women's College World Series, season canceled due to COVID. Um NCAA Super Regionals previous to that, she was the uh she was uh, the w Women's College World Series champion. Um, she has made, what, since 2014, one, two, three, four. So since 2014 and those seven years, but they've only played six because of the COVID cancellation. So in the last six seasons, she has made the World Series four times and she has been in the finals twice with one championship to and, her game. And that's awesome. And done something that the baseball program has never done. And she's right, one, one. So there is no denying what she means for this program and how good she is. But I do wonder, well, I wonder two things. One, I disagree that we should do everything we can to keep her because we, to, to our, our buddy's point, we just don't have the resources to do it all right now. Like we have to be all in on football. And I'm sorry that that means other sports. It's not just women's sports, but I'm baseball Olympic sports, they're going to have to take a hit right now because we have to focus on football if we're going to be who we used to be. And that's what makes money for the university's athletic department. If we don't get better at football, we won't be involved in whatever kind of crazy realignment's going to going to happen. And we just aren't going to have a seat at the table and we're just never going to get out of the death spiral. So that being said, I don't know what's in it for Lonnie to go to Texas A&M other than the paycheck. Yep. And I know the paycheck's big. And trust me, I love money as much as the next person. But it, it, I, I go back to the Patriot line, right? It's one of my favorite lines when two things seem different, but they're the same. When Mel Gibson stands up and he says, why would I trade one tyrant 3,000 miles away for 3,000 tyrants one mile away? Now, the way I relate that to this situation is that, yes, she would be paid more money. But you cannot convince me for a second that softball will be treated any differently at Texas A&M. The dollar figure is bigger, but you will still be treated like a second-class citizen because all they care about there is football. And every now and then they start to care about baseball and stuff, but it's not Mississippi State where like they really care about baseball and softball. It's not Oklahoma where that school legitimately cares about softball. You're going to be in this, if you feel underappreciated, which I hope she doesn't because yeah. she means so much to this university, but I'm kind of, so I'm kind of using more Krikorian here. But if you feel unappreciated at Florida State, you will feel the same way at Texas a and There'll just be more money in your bank account. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know what she's going to decide to do. But Dave, I, I, look, I think your point is valid for all the reasons you said we need to keep her. But for me, I just think you have to go all in on football right now. And, and, and unfortunately, there may be some collateral damage there. 
but it's what this athletic department has to do. Yeah, I'm just look, I'm sick of I'm sick of taking L's. Uh it just feels like a lot has gone wrong. The basketball team drastically underperformed. The softball team got kicked out of the first round, ironically. Uh the baseball team barely squeaked in and kept its uh regional streak alive. Obviously, the football team and soccer coach left. Like there's just a lot of flux right now. And having arguably our best program and most consistent program continue to stay as it is even though it's not one of the revenue generating sports at FSU, I, I think you just have to keep that intact. I, she has a well-oiled machine running with this program right now. So there is an incentive for her too. It's not just like we have to keep her like she needs us too. like, she has a great thing going here. She's being paid. Well, I I'm certain she's going to be paid even better. Um, and yeah, like you said at Texas A&M, if she thinks if this renewed commitment to football here makes her think, wow, uh, I'm not getting the attention and this program's not getting the attention it needs and deserves. Wait till you go to a school who does all that weird yelling, shouting practice stuff. And that's all they care about. So that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, no, that I'm with you, man. And, and just to give the viewers and the listeners one, one quick tidbit uh, earlier today, Florida state it's men's baseball was selected to the Auburn regional. So they will go to Auburn, Alabama and and that's a really good draw. Auburn is the 14th of 16 regionals. Yep. So, um, I, I mean, look, you, yeah, it's beatable. You really couldn't ask for a better regional to pull unless, and honestly, I wouldn't have even wanted to go to Maryland or Georgia Southern because Georgia Southern's regional has Notre Dame in it, who just spanked you in the conference tournament. And up at Maryland's regional, Maryland can get hot and they've got Wake Forest. So you've got Auburn, Southeastern, Louisiana, and UCLA, who I think are three beatable teams, especially with this pitching rotation. Yep. And I'm excited to see what they do. But folks, we'll talk more about that later in the week. We appreciate you coming by. Please, again, thank you for the love and support. Make sure you subscribe. But even if you don't, like, thanks for being here. I love talking yeah. about Florida State sports, as does Dave. And y'all give us the platform to do it. And we hope that we reciprocate that um, with the information and the perspective and all of the things that we give you. So with that, that's Dave. I'm Max. And this was Locked on Seminoles. Oh, no.